It all began with a very short video that was posted online. It was a shady recording of an old couple in a car, driving recklessly as if they were running away from something. You could hear in the video as the wife was panicking. She kept on saying, I'm recording. Where is it? Where is it? Again and again, while her husband was driving and telling her to shut up. The video was shaky and you couldn't tell what exactly was going on. After less than 20 seconds, the car crashed and they both died. Aside from the recorded car crash, what really stirred up arguments was what it was that the wife was trying to capture on video. The recording was very shaky, and most of the shots were blurred because she was panning it back and forth quite aggressively as she looked around. At first, nobody could see anything odd about it. However, she actually captured something within less than a half a second when she turned the camera back to the front before they crashed. Someone looked closely to every single frame of the entire 20 second video and he posted the captures, which he claimed to have revealed what it was. In just mere two frames within a fraction of a second, there was a silhouette of a huge dog right outside the car window, and on the second frame, it looked like the dog was running upright with its two hind legs. People with strong opinions rose to the challenge and came up with answers. As usual, the silliest of the bunch were the noisiest ones. Most of them said that the posted frame captures were doctored, but this claim was proven wrong when a few other people did the same thing, and they were also able to extract the same frames from the recording. When they claimed that the video itself was a fake, a few even reached a conclusion that it was just a promotional video of an indie film that was never released. This was proven wrong again when actual reports were aired with the same car in the same exact spot that was recorded in the video. Oddly enough, the report also included a detail that proved the presence of a huge dog. On the same side of the car window in the video, there was a huge dent and some faint claw marks on the door. It looked as if the car was deliberately pushed off the road so it would crash into a tree. The bodies of the couple were never found. Unlike the others, I didn't have to guess what happened in the video. I knew for a fact that it wasn't doctored. They had no reason to do such a thing. I also knew that it wasn't a promotional video. They were not actors in any way. Even with that crappy video, I recognized their voices easily. The unfortunate couple were my old friend's folks back in the countryside. Kevin was his name. Now before even going to Kevin's place, I already had a few ideas that might have led them to that situation. His parents liked to hunt once in a while, and Kevin's dad could get a little reckless sometimes. Aside from him, his wife would often just take pictures and eat in the car. There were a few occasions when some of the animals were attracted to the food that his wife would carelessly leave behind, and then she would forget and leave the car with the windows open. They were fun to be with, but Kevin had gotten into troubles because of their behavior a few times. It has been a long time since I last saw Kevin. They moved far from the city and I was too busy at work that I never got to check on him. When I arrived at their place... The situation was quite concerning. It looked like he hasn't been sleeping. Kevin's room was filthy and it looked like it belonged to a madman. Several prints and paper articles about the reported sightings of a man with a dog's face were pinned on the wall. There was a map with a bunch of markings, as if he was looking for something. It was pretty obvious to me that Kevin was trying to hunt this thing down. When I gave him my condolences, he just flipped on me and said that his parents must still be alive since their bodies were not found. Aside from that, they were able to upload the video as well. I chose to respect his hopes and wishes. However, in the reports, 
There were pictures of stains of blood on the seats. It had been almost a month since the incident. If they were still alive, they should have contacted him or anybody else by then. I wanted to say this to him so that he could move on, but it looked to me that he wasn't in the right state of mind at the time. I decided to stay for a few days. He then began to tell me what he discovered since he started investigating. There were several sightings of dogmen in various places, so he concentrated on the ones nearest to the incident. That place was pretty much a vast forest. However, there was a new factory that was being built not far from it, and they cut a lot of trees down in that area. Kevin thought that whatever the thing was, it must have been forced out of its home because of the deforestation, and then moved to where his parents hunted. Now, there were too many reports and stories about this strange cryptid, and frankly, I couldn't get myself to believe any of them. Aside from that, I thought there must be a more plausible explanation to this incident. It could have just been a skinny bear or something like that, a coyote, I don't know. But I did feel sorry for what Kevin was experiencing. I couldn't imagine how it must be to lose your parents at the same time, and with no bodies that he could mourn and bury. The sharing of the video wasn't helping either. His parents were getting needlessly criticized by people who knew nothing about them, and some of the comments were quite disrespectful. A few self-proclaimed cryptozoologists were messaging Kevin, but most of them were just into the hype. They weren't helping with the case. They were only blowing things out of proportion, honestly. Some even connected this dogman to the sightings of unidentified flying objects. <laughs> However, there was one guy who contacted him that seemed to have a credible story. He was also a hunter who had been hunting on the same grounds a number of times. He said that there were two separate occasions which he believed that he encountered this thing. On one of those occasions, it was possible that he saw more than one. He was hunting mostly on the site where they took all the trees down. He said that there were a few holes in the ground that were used as wolf traps. And on one of those traps, a fellow hunter saw a path that led to a spacious area beneath the forest ground. This little cave in the ground was later filled and covered so the ground wouldn't collapse. However, there was no guarantee that it was the only one. On the first encounter, he thought it was just the wolf. Now, he hated the wolves because they were tremendously decreasing the population of the deer in the area, causing an imbalance in the forest as a whole. And so, he shot at it. And to his shock, he said the wolf just suddenly stood on its two legs and ran like a person. Now, in the other encounter, he already had a hunch about this thing so he was a bit more cautious. When he was about to claim a deer that he put down, he saw a hairy humanoid dragging it by the leg and ran away with his catch. Unexpectedly, he didn't really see the others. He heard the others, but he didn't see them. He was afraid that he was outnumbered, and the sound came from around him as if they were already observing the deer way before he shot at it. So, he ran away as well. He said that being a hunter for a long time, that you would develop this instinct, that you'll know if there's a more dominant predator around in the area. And if you feel that, you get away as fast and quiet as you can before you come the prey. That was what he felt during that second encounter. Now, he had only felt that maybe one or two other times before when he had encountered large bears. We decided to meet up with this particular hunter. His name was Gerald, a former soldier. The man was in his late 40s, driving a truck and armed with a hunting rifle. The other guy who practically forced himself in joining us was Oliver, an annoying and incredibly persistent cryptozoologist. This time, 
we decided to do something that all of us never did before. We would camp in the area. Right in the beginning of our meetup, you could already see the intention of these individuals. Gerald was fully equipped with hunting gear, armed with a long-range rifle, a handgun, and a bunch of knives from the belt down to his boots. On the other hand, Oliver was equipped with a bunch of cameras. Me, however, I just wanted to be on the side of my friend. He had nobody else left but me. I joined so that I could pull him out of the scene if things got too dangerous. If ever, by a long shot that this thing actually existed. Now on that first night, our hours were spent with Oliver talking about the sightings of different cryptids. While Gerald would politely interrupt them with his more credible and actually more interesting stories about his experiences as a soldier. Gerald's stories were pretty good, but the night went pretty slow, aside from the hoots of the owls and random noises from the bushes, which were probably bunnies or squirrels. There was nothing else. For a while there, I thought that this camping would lead to nowhere and we would just go home. But the things we saw the next day had me question my doubts about this creature. The next morning, we decided to roam the forest and go deeper. We went to where the new factory was being built. Gerald noticed something strange. He said that this factory should be operational by now, but nobody was there. The property was abandoned. We decided to get closer, and it was then that we saw the scratches on the walls. It looked as though the property was attacked. The scrapings looked like claw marks of something big. I said to them that it must have been a bear. Although, in the back of my head, I didn't believe what I was saying. The place was definitely sabotaged. The pipelines were trashed and the heavy machineries were dismantled. A bear wouldn't go to this extent. Gerald closely examined the claw marks. With a sarcastic yet polite manner, he responded to my claim. He said that it could be a bear, or rather a group of bears, but they must be remarkably intelligent ones that he never heard of or even encountered before. The machines were smashed with heavy tools, and the gate was broken open in a way that a person would forcefully open it. Aside from that, Gerald told me that bears would never do anything like this. Whatever or whoever did this, the intention was clear. It was reclaiming this territory. It was probably the worst, the bravest, yet the stupidest decision we ever made when we decided to move our camp closer to the abandoned factory. Whatever the thing was, it couldn't be any more clear that it was extremely territorial. As we were pitching our tents, Oliver saw something when he walked around. There was something laying on the top of a tree. It looked like a large piece of tree bark, but we wondered why it was up there. Kevin and I decided to climb up to see what it was, and I really couldn't tell what I was looking at. There were slabs of meat placed on the bark, and the strangest thing about it was how it was set up. The bark was securely mounted on the highest branches of the tree by tying it with long strips of someone's shirt. As we were inspecting the cloth, Kevin's hands started to jitter as he breathed heavily. He recognized the shirt. The strips of cloth were pieces of his father's clothes. We told the guys about it when we climbed back down, and Oliver explained to us what he thought it might be. It was written in several journals from different remarkable people in history, which, coincidentally, matched each other's description about the matter. That drying the meat under the sun before eating it was a practice that was done by a particular kind of group. These beings were no savages nor mindless freaks of nature. They were an intelligent kind that was said to coexist among mankind in the early times, they behaved humanely, with decency and kindness when treated fairly. 
On the other hand, they were also described as barbaric and feared upon once they got provoked. There were small society of people with heads resembling jackals or wild dogs, but far from how the recent descriptions of the cryptid dogmen who were more like primitive beasts. This was the clan of Cynocephali. After hearing this information, Gerald suggested we leave the meat on the bark alone. They were most likely to return and get it, and so we decided to move far from it. Now, I wanted to go. Kevin's parents were obviously dead. There was no reason for us to stay there. But Gerald wanted to hunt these things down, and Oliver, although obviously afraid, wanted to see these creatures for himself. Kevin wanted to stay as well. He didn't say anything about it, but it seemed to me that he wanted revenge. Given the situation, even I was almost certain that we would have an encounter. Gerald was surprisingly more prepared than I anticipated, and he came up with a plan. Instead of staying in the tents for the night, we would use them as decoys, and so we set up a small camouflage tent that could be easily covered by the leaves. We would have to spend the entire night on our backs, but it was better than being mauled for being too obvious. Oliver set up his motion-sensing cameras around the area. He wanted to make sure that we would have a good picture of these beings, so people would believe what we were about to see. As the night fell upon us, I could feel the heavy tension of the imminent danger we were putting ourselves in. Just a day ago, I did not believe that these things existed, and now I was praying not to get eaten by them. I wondered how many there were. I assumed maybe two, four, five at max. Gerald was armed with his rifle, patiently waiting. He thought that after shooting at least one of them, the others would run away. But he was so wrong. After a few hours, we started hearing some faint steps from afar, and then we saw a flash of light. One of the cameras that Oliver set up was triggered. Kevin got mad at him. He said that he shouldn't have put flashes on his cameras because it would drive them away. And Oliver said that he wanted a clear shot. At least just one would be enough. For me, I wish that the flash would be enough to drive them away. As they were arguing, Gerald suddenly spoke with a different tone. He suddenly became more serious and said, Don't say another fucking word. Don't move. They're here. From the faint glow of the light sticks that Oliver spread near the tents, my heart started to pound rapidly as I saw shadows of large canine creatures passing by. There were three of them circling the tents. Gerald started to breathe deeply and slowly. Then he carefully adjusted his aim. He whispered that he had the shot, but just as he was about to pull the trigger, a large, hairy arm suddenly reached in and grabbed the barrel of his rifle. He had a good plan, but it wasn't good enough. A head slowly peeked in. It was covered with dark fur from the tips of its upright ears and to the end of its muzzle. He stared at each of us with his orange eyes, and he started to grumble. They figured us out completely. Our camouflage tent was brashly pulled out from the mound. We were all lined up there like a group of resting cats as these creatures were surrounding us, looking down upon us. And then they started to growl. We sat up slowly, shaking, all scared and helpless. But Gerald had a different reaction to the situation. The barrel of his rifle was still held by one of them. As he sat up, he hastily reached for the gun holstered on his thigh, and immediately fired point-blank at the one dogman's head. For a few seconds, I thought that they would just run away when they saw one of them die. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. We angered them even further, and there were twelve of them. We were totally outnumbered, and all of them were bigger than any of us. 
After they howled for their falling comrade, they spread their arms wide and exposed their sharp claws as they growled. Gerald reached for his bag. He commanded us to look away and cover our ears. He pulled out a flashbang and immediately removed the pin just before these angered beasts could do anything. And he shouted, Run! Run fast! As the flashbang exploded in the opposite direction, we ran as fast as we possibly could. My ears were still ringing even though I covered them. I almost tumbled down several times as I struggled to keep my balance. I wasn't looking back, I just kept on running, and I could hear Gerald shooting far behind me. But no matter how hard we try, these things were impossible to outrun. And I hardly heard it when Gerald told Oliver to throw him his bag and to pull out the other flashbang. The next thing I heard was Gerald's screams as we left him behind. We had no choice. There was nothing that we could possibly do. The flash of the grenade had more effect on these creatures because of their more sensitive hearing compared to us. Aside from that, some of them mistakenly looked at the grenade as it exploded and they were blinded for a while. Oliver did what Gerald said. He pulled out another flashbang. He shouted at Kevin just right behind me to catch the bag and said that there was one more in there. As he tossed the bag to Kevin, the second flashbang exploded. Some of them were slowed down while others totally got disoriented and stopped following. Unfortunately, three of them saw it coming and effectively avoided it. They caught up with Oliver and they mauled him down. It was like a pattern. After the person would pass the bag, that person would die. I looked back and asked Kevin to run ahead of me. I told him that I would take the bag. The least I could do was allow my friend to run away from this nightmare and perhaps he would survive. As I slightly slowed down, I saw that there were only two of these beasts that remained behind us, but they were about to catch up. As I was about to line up with Kevin, he already handed me the bag and pushed me forward. When I reached inside the bag, all that was in there were the keys to Gerald's truck. As I turned my head, I saw Kevin holding the remaining flashbang. He removed the pin, but he didn't throw it. He smiled at me, and then he ran at the opposite direction toward the two remaining dogmen. The bomb exploded and the remaining beast was blinded. Kevin must have realized what I was about to do, and he decided to do it himself to save me. When I reached the road, I quickly jumped in the truck and drove away. I was the only one who managed to survive. I immediately told the police what had happened, and they went back there, but they found nothing. All of our gear were taken, including the tents and cameras. There was no trace of Kevin, Gerald, nor Oliver. It was as if nothing had happened. I had no proof to prove what occurred in the forest aside from my story, and they did not believe it for obvious reasons. All I became was another report of an incident about an encounter with the creatures that people don't believe in, and my friends paid with their lives for it. <laughs>